Jesus was not talking to you. There is a joke so old that by now, probably every preacher in America has told it at least once. It involves the resurrection of Lazarus. Had Jesus said, come forth, every person in every grave would have arisen. But what Jesus did say was, Lazarus, come forth, so only Lazarus arose. Had you been in your grave at that time, you would have stayed right where you were because Jesus wasn't talking to you. When someone very much like you attempted to speak to the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 15, he answered her not a word because he wasn't talking to her either. When she persisted, Christ explained, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15 verses 22 to 24. Like you, she was a Gentile, and not only was Christ a minister of the circumcision, later we learn from Paul that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, and that Christ was a minister of the circumcision. From that, it becomes clear that what Christ had to say in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John belongs of Israel and not to us. What would Jesus do? Is not a good question then, since when you read the red letters in your Bible you know Jesus wasn't talking to you. When two people are talking and a stranger but in, we know that was rude and wrong. Christ came not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10, 6, 15, 24, Romans 15, verse 8, yet we who are strangers, Ephesians 2, verse 12, but in as if Christ were speaking to us. When two people are eating at a restaurant and a stranger comes along and takes things from each plate, we know that was rude and wrong. Christ had only crumbs for Gentile dogs, Matthew 15 verse 27, yet we would push Israel from the table and take their portion for ourselves. When one person gives something to another person, but a stranger comes along and steals that item and claims it for himself, we know that was rude and wrong. Christ taught Israel about its kingdom which would come to this earth, Matthew 6 verse 10, yet we who inherit heavenly places, Ephesians 1 verse 3, want to steal Israel's earthly kingdom as well. Christ was a minister of the circumcision, Romans 15 verse 8. Christ sent Paul to us, Romans 11 13, 15 16, Acts 26 verse 17. Christ chose Paul and delegated to Paul that he be our pattern, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. We are to preach Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that Christ revealed to Paul, Romans 16 verse 25, not according to the red letters in the Bible, which were spoken to Israel. We listen to Paul because Christ's instructions for us come to us through Paul, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22. We are not obedient to Christ if we fail to follow Paul, I Corinthians 4 16, 11, colon 1, Philippians 3 verse 17. Pure and simple, Jesus wasn't talking to you. About prayer, when he said, After this manner therefore pray ye, and that should be obvious from the fact that Israel was God's firstborn son, Exodus 4 verse 22, and Gentiles were strangers, Ephesians 2 verse 12, so that we could not even say our father as God was not our father, and we were part of the first Adam's sinful family. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22 We expect to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17, when we are absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, in heavenly places, so it would be silly for us to pray thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth, as it is in heaven, Matthew 6 verse 10, when it is not our kingdom, and we won't be on the earth. Jesus wasn't talking to you about prayer when he said whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you, John 16.23, and you would be the wrong person to have such authority in prayer for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself mocketh intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. Romans 8 verse 26 Jesus wasn't talking to you about prayer when he said, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16 verse 19 Christ was talking to Peter, the same Peter who did not understand the cross, 
The same Peter who failed the first time he tried to bind something. Matthew 16 verses 21 to 23 Jesus wasn't talking to you about faith as a grain of mustard seed or mountain-moving faith. Matthew 17 verse 20 And you know that because you cannot even turn to the next page in this book without using your fingers. About your salvation when he said, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6 verses 14 to 15 on this side of Christ's cross, we know that God is not even imputing trespasses to us, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, because God imputed them to Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 Jesus wasn't talking to you about your salvation when he said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. John 3 verse 7 KJV, rather than a new birth, we become an entirely new creature, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, and our life is hid in Christ, Colossians 3 verse 3, and begins with our crucifixion, Galatians 2 verse 20, and our death to the old man, Romans 6 verses 4 to 6, not with a second birth. Christ was talking to one man, Nicodemus, and we know that because the words the and thou in our King James Bibles are always nominative singular. Christ, who was sent not but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24, tells Nicodemus about what all Israel must do, and we know that because the word ye and you in our King James Bibles are always nominative plural. Jesus was saying to one man what all Israel must do, to which Peter agreed. 1 Peter 1 verse 23 And we know that Peter was not talking to Gentiles, 1 Peter 2 verse 12, and that neither Peter nor Israel was in possession of God's grace, 1 Peter 1 verse 13. Jesus wasn't talking to you about your salvation when he said, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Matthew 24 verse 13 KJV, the whole of Matthew 24 involves Christ's explaining elements of the great tribulation, Matthew 24 verse 21, to the Hebrew people. Miles Coverdale said in 1535 that it shall greatly help you to understand the scriptures if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom and with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth after. Christ's statement about enduring to the end is in the context of Daniel's abomination of desolation, Matthew 24 verse 15 and the gospel of the kingdom, Matthew 24 verse 14, not the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20 verse 24 For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16, KJV This most popular and most familiar of all Bible verses is not the gospel by which your soul is saved. We get that from Christ, but though Paul, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel by which also ye are saved, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. John 3 verse 16 is about the Hebrew people, John 4 verse 22, and is conditional upon performance, John 5 verse 29. It relates to Israel's receiving its Messiah, John 1 verse 12, to which they testified by being baptized in water, John 1 verses 30 to 31. While new translations say that Jesus was God's only son or one and only son, we know that's not true, Exodus 4 verse 22, Galatians 4 verse 6. And we know Christ was not begotten in Bethlehem, because Paul tells us Christ was begotten at the cross, Acts 13 verse 33, which confirmed the prophecy in the second psalm. If then, you have tickets to the ball game and you have painted John 3 verse 16 on your chest, keep your shirt on. About healing when he said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Matthew 10 verse 8, 
neither you nor your pastor nor the evangelist who showed up in his half-million-dollar bus can cure acne pimples, much less cleanse lepers. Stories are told about the dead being raised, and many claim to have cast out devils, but those events never seem to be independently verified and you never read such things in your newspaper. All you need to do to convince the gainsayers would be to hold a healing meeting with all the greatest faith healers in America and cure just one acne zit, just one nasty little pimple. The men Christ sent to heal were not to go to Gentiles, Matthew 10 verse 5, but only to Israel, and that was because the Jews, the Hebrew people, require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. Signs, including healing, served the purpose of providing proof of a man, his message, and his ministry. While there are literally dozens of examples in your Bible, this one stands out. And John calling unto him two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. Luke 7 verses 19 to 22 KJV The purpose of the healings which Christ performed was not about the sick people or about sick people being healed. The purpose of the miracles performed in the passage was to provide proof to John that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. Jesus' ministry to Israel was the issue when Isaiah prophesied that, with his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53 verse 5, for the we in the passage most certainly would not include Gentiles. When Peter quoted Isaiah, 1 Peter 2 verse 24, he was speaking to Israel, 1 Peter 2 verse 12, and since we do not require signs, we should know better than to expect healing miracles. Jesus instructed the Apostle Paul to tell us that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Romans 8 verse 18 Christ updated Paul with respect to healing when Paul learned my grace is sufficient for thee. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 Paul had prayed three times to be healed, but after Christ gave him this new information about the sufficiency of grace, Paul immediately adjusted. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10 KJV Paul says that he is taking pleasure in what most people who attend healing meetings want to go away, someone is wrong, and it's not Paul. Jesus Christ existed before Bethlehem. John 1 verse 15, was born to Mary, Luke 2 verse 7, grew up as a child, Luke 2 verse 34, became a man, Romans 5 verse 15, and arose from the dead, Luke 24 verse 34. These facts make it clear that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, and today, and forever, Hebrews 13 verse 8, could not possibly be about anything physical. Christ is unchanged in His holiness, in His sinless perfection, in His godly attributes, Christ's dealings with people changed, and that should be as clear to see as a zit on someone's nose. About your abundant life when He said, The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10 verse 10 KJV the thief is going to be the Antichrist, Matthew 24 verse 43, and they are the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to whom Christ came. Matthew 10 verse 6, Matthew 15 verse 24. Christ instructed the Apostle Paul to tell us to learn in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content, Philippians 4 verse 11, and that because godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6 verse 6. The story is often repeated of a man who gained great wealth, but lost it all. 
He did not give up, he worked hard, and he amassed an even greater fortune. His testimony was, I have been rich, and I have been poor, rich is better. Paul said that the issue was not being rich or being poor, but serving Christ, regardless of circumstances. Philippians 4 verses 11 to 13. We are not here as subjects of the King of Kings, Revelation 17 verse 14, busily establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth. Revelation 11 verse 15. We are here as God's ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, in this present evil world, Galatians 1 verse 4, in a time when Satan is the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 3 to 4. Everything changed when Israel fell, Romans 11 verse 11, so that salvation could come to the Gentiles by God's grace, not by works of righteousness. The plain truth is that too often Christians neglect or deny that we are not Israel, Galatians 3 verse 28, Colossians 3 verse 11, and Israel's place and position are not ours to usurp. Ephesians 2 verse 12, our inheritance is in heavenly places, Ephesians 1 verse 3, not on this earth, which explains why we are told to set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3 verse 2. Now might be a good time to read the prayer requests in your church's bulletin or in your prayer journal to see how many of them are about eternal things and how many are about the things on this earth. How many prayer requests start with thanksgiving, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18, rather than Lord please do this and Lord please give me that. Instead of hearing prayers of thanksgiving, the Lord more often must endure our selfish whine. When we are given a list of items that cannot separate us from the love of God, of course we are thankful for the enduring connection rather than having to suffer separation. That said, note the items that we might endure, even though we are not separated from the love of God. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8 verses 35 to 39 KJV Rather than sitting by the pool, enjoying the abundant life, it would be wise to be prepared to endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 Believers who think they have Israel's promises for an abundant life are away without leave rather than fighting the good fight of faith. When Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, which is a very good thing since you have disobeyed or assiduously avoided most of what he taught in that message. Christ taught whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Matthew 5 verse 22. We have all been angry lots of times, but where is the judgment? And Christ taught whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. Matthew 5 verse 22. Well here goes, Raka, 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 to you and the horse you rode in on. Now what? Where is this council to which Christ referred? And Christ taught whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Matthew 5 verse 22. Does that mean Paul is in danger of hell fire because Paul said some people were fools? Galatians 3 verses 1 to 3. Have you ever been angry, maybe at a family member, but you still went to church? Did you leave your gift on the altar, make up with the person who was the object of your anger, and then return to church and give your gift? Have you ever seen or heard of anyone in any church ever doing that which Christ explicitly instructed in Matthew 5 verse 24? For reasons only he could explain, former President Jimmy Carter allowed himself to be interviewed by Playboy magazine and gave this infamous quote, Christ set some almost impossible standards for us. 
Christ said, I tell you that anyone who looks on a woman with lust has in his heart already committed adultery. I have looked on a lot of women with lust. I have committed adultery in my heart many times. That being the case, what was he doing teaching Sunday school when the penalty for adultery is death? Matthew 5 verse 28, Leviticus 20 verse 10. When President Carter said Christ set some almost impossible standards for us, he was wrong twice. The 39th President Carter should have omitted the almost because the standards Christ gave in his Sermon on the Mount are impossible for us. And that is because the standards Christ set forth were not for us, but rather for Kingdom Israel. The whole of the Sermon on the Mount is about the Kingdom come and when the Kingdom does come, Israel will be able to meet Christ's standards, having been enabled by the Holy Spirit. And I will put my Spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments, and do them. Ezekiel 36 verse 27 KJV If you are holding fast to the Sermon on the Mount and protesting that you are doing the best, you can be that person with the right attitudes, Beatitudes, now might be a good time to ask you to put your money where your mouth is. Nothing personal, mind you, but how about sending a gift of $50,000 to the Dispensational Bible Institute to aid its ministry of equipping new preachers to teach with Pauline dispensational understanding? Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee turn not thou away. Matthew 5 verse 42, Luke 6 verse 40. You have just been asked to give, and your gifts will be used by a 501c3 not-for-profit corporation so that you can deduct what you give from your income taxes. Although you might spiritualize verses so as to pretend that you are following the Sermon on the Mount, we both know you have no intention of sending a gift, which is why we did not give you a mailing address, we knew you would not need it. About your forgiveness, when he said, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6 verses 14 to 15 KJV The good news is the basis for our being forgiven is the cross of Christ and not our attitudes toward other people. Of course, when Jesus said what he did about forgiveness, it was 21 chapters before his payment for sin took place. Millions upon millions of people are led in their churches to pray for their trespasses to be forgiven and to forgive those who trespass against them, thinking that assures them of God's forgiveness. Such prayers and such thinking were rendered inappropriate nearly 2,000 years ago because of Christ's payment for sin with his death, burial, and resurrection. It makes no sense to pray for forgiveness of trespasses when God is not imputing their trespasses onto them. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19 Our trespasses and everyone else's trespasses were imputed to Christ, which is why they are no longer being imputed to us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 Because Christ was made to be sin in our place, God could impute our sin, trespasses, to Christ so that an acceptable payment for sin could be made. That is how God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, but make no mistake, reconciliation is not salvation. While it is true that everyone's sins were imputed to Christ, his payment for our sin must be accepted before Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Reconciliation is available to everyone, but no individual is reconciled without faith in Christ's payment for his or her sins. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1 verse 16 KJV For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18 KJV Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. 
For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 KJV The gospel of Christ is his death, burial, and resurrection as payment for our sins. Asking God to forgive us because we forgive other people evidences a failure to appreciate what Christ accomplished for us by shedding his blood on that cruel cross. Similarly, millions are depending on if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 verse 9 KJV since we already have forgiveness, Ephesians 1 verse 7, Colossians 1 verse 14, and have already been cleansed, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, what would our point be in asking for forgiveness and cleansing? Clearly, 1 John 1 verse 9 must be instructions for people who are lacking what God imputed to us on the merits of Christ's cross. 1 John is a Hebrew epistle, and we are not the Hebrews. John agreed to communicate with the circumcision and not with Gentiles, Galatians 2 verses 7 to 9, and we know that Israel must await its grace, 1 Peter 1 verse 13, until Christ returns to this earth and their prayer of thy kingdom come, Matthew 6 verse 10, is answered. We are saved by grace through faith now, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 and have a present possession of complete forgiveness, Romans 5, 1, 5, 11, Colossians 2, verse 13. Our response to sin, trespasses, should not be asking for the forgiveness we already have, but rather putting an end to the bad behavior, Ephesians 2, verses 22 and 24, and being who God has made us in Christ Jesus, Galatians 2, verses 20 to 21. About your finances when Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Matthew 19 verse 21 KJV When people who aren't selling everything to give anything to anybody claim to be followers of Jesus, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, it is probably not that they mean to be hypocrites, more likely they simply don't know that following Jesus is the wrong thing for us to do. They think Jesus was talking to them when he was not. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 KJV One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Mark 10 verse 21. Every spring there are people who make a big show out of dragging a cross around, and while they might get publicity, those same people not only have not sold whatsoever they owned, they would think you were crazy if you suggested such a course of action. Clearly, Christ's instructions were for a different setting and not for present day application. When Israel's kingdom is in place, God promises to feed and clothe his kingdom people. We have no such promise. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 10 KJV So much for having our daily bread given to us. The fact that things in the Bible change from time to time is not difficult to see. And he said unto them, Take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. Luke 9 verse 3 KJV Later, Christ changed his specific instructions. Then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment, and buy one. Luke 22 verse 36 KJV The but now tells you that what had been the previous instructions, Luke 9 verse 3, had been replaced. Consider what this, but now, teaches us. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, 
and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Romans 16 verses 25 to 26 KJV These verses clearly state that the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery is a but now activity which can happen because that which had been kept secret has been made known. The Apostle Peter makes it clear that what Peter preached at Pentecost was nothing new but rather was a continuation of Israel's prophetic program. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. began. Acts 3 verses 19 to 21 KJV. Peter says he was preaching that which everyone knew since the world began and Paul says he was preaching that which had been kept secret since the world began. The content of their messages simply cannot have been the same. Understanding that Jesus wasn't talking to you about finances then, is greatly helped by separating Israel's prophecy information from Paul's mystery information. Jesus Christ is our Savior, and so it is right for us to pay attention to every word he said, but since he was not talking to us, we do well to look to Paul for our doctrine because it is in Paul's writings alone that we find Christ's instructions for us. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, Romans 11 verses 13 and 1 Timothy 1 16. Every verse in our Bible has three applications, 1. Historical, 2. Spiritual, 3. Doctrinal. When it comes to the red letters, just as in the Old Testament, just as in the Hebrew epistles, only two of the three applications work for us, our doctrine must be entirely Pauline. And here might be a good place to make another point that hardly anyone seems to have learned. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament books. The fact that you have a title page in your Bible between Malachi and Matthew, which supposedly separates the Old from the New Testament, means less than nothing when we have it from God that where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Hebrews 9 verse 16 from that we know that the first 27 chapters of Matthew, the first 15 chapters of Mark, the first 23 chapters of Luke and the first 19 chapter of John are before the death of the testator, Christ, so they must be under the Old Testament. No less important than the separating of Israel's prophecy program from our mystery program is the issue of separating Israel's legal covenant, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 and our freedom from the law. Romans 6 verse 14, Galatians 5 verse 1. Israel's Legal Covenant Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34 KJV Our freedom from the law For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
Romans 6 verse 14, KJV. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Galatians 5 verse 1, KJV. This affects your finances in that you would be wrong to tithe, and that when Christ taught tithing, Matthew 23 verses 1 to 2, 23, he was not talking to you. Under the law, giving was a necessity, Malachi 3 verses 9 to 10, which is not true for you. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Malachi 3 verses 9 to 10 KJV Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 KJV what is really terrible about teaching the tithe, however, has nothing to do with money or the fact that no one can tell you what to give because you are to purpose your giving in your heart. What is terrible is that teachers of the tithe put you under God's curse if you don't give. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Malachi 3 verses 8 to 9 KJV Not only have you not robbed God by not tithing, and you cannot be put under a curse. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Galatians 3 verse 13 it is bad enough for preachers to put people under the law when they are supposed to be at liberty, Galatians 4 verses 9 to 11, but it is reprehensible to threaten people with a curse when Christ took our curse upon himself. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Galatians 4 verses 9 to 11 KJV When Jesus said, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet withal, it shall be measured to you again. Luke 6 verse 38 KJV not only was Jesus not talking to you, but he also wasn't even talking about finances. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over is about grapes, and grapes are used as an illustration of what the Lord was speaking about in the context, which was love and forgiveness. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what think have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners, to receive as much again. Luke 6 verse 34, KJV You might be uncomfortable hearing that Jesus was not talking to you, but isn't that better than pretending you are obedient to what he said when you are not? Haven't you always been bothered by the many things the Lord said to which you pay no attention? Don't you get tired of making excuses? Have you noticed that you treat some Bible verses as if they did not even exist? When you enjoy that great feast of turkey and dressing at Thanksgiving time, do you obey the Lord's instruction that when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not they friends, nor they brethren, neither they kinsmen, nor they rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Luke 14 verses 12 to 13. Of course not, but why not? And why continue to say that you are following the Lord when you are not and would be wrong if you did? The principle involved here is sometimes called dispensationalism, is sometimes called progressive revelation, and is almost always called weird or scary. However, it is really quite simple. After the Lord ascended to heaven, Acts 1 verse 9, 
after Peter preached how terrible it was that Christ had been crucified, Acts 2 verse 33, and that the great tribulation was about to take place, Acts 2 verses 16 to 17, the Lord Jesus Christ did something no one was expecting. He made a return to this earth, and it wasn't the prophesied second coming, Acts 9 verses 3 to 5. It was then that Saul of Tarsus became Paul the Apostle, and Christ gave our marching orders to Paul, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, and Paul wrote them in the 13 books of the Bible in which Christ does speak to you through Paul. When Paul got his instructions from the Lord, Paul was the last person to see Christ, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, and the first person to be saved by grace alone, so as to be our pattern. 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. When Paul writes to or about Israel, likely you will know it, Romans 2 verse 17. For the most part, however, when you read Paul's books is when Jesus was talking to you. In the four Gospels, Luke 1 verse 70, and in Peter's preaching in the book of Acts, the message was that which had come from the mouth of all gods that which had come from the mouth of all gods that which had come from the mouth of all gods 21. Christ gave a mystery message to Paul that had never been preached because it had been hidden since the world began. Romans 16 verses 25 to 26. That those two messages cannot be the same is obvious, but what must not be as obvious is that Christ is talking to you in Paul's epistles, not in the Gospels, not in the red letters. Perhaps this still seems a bit weird and more that a bit scary, that's to be expected. After all, there are no denominations teaching this concept and there are no accredited schools you could attend to learn it. So, what is a person to do? Having listened to this material, should you pluck out your eye? Matthew 5 verse 29 Having held this weird and scary material in your hand, must you now cut off your hand? Matthew 5 verse 30 Are you determined to continue to take place of a Jew and listen to Christ when he wasn't talking to you? Or will you learn from Christ, through Paul, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, but a new creature? Galatians 3 verse 28 Jesus wasn't talking to you in the red letters is actually very good news, once you get over the shock. When he was not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24, Christ said that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15 verse 13 When Christ taught Paul the revelation of the mystery, Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 10, we learn of a love even greater than that which had been revealed in the Gospels. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 verse 8 KJV That is very good news, because we heathen Gentiles most certainly would not have been numbered among his friends in the Gospels. That means that Christ's love for us is revealed to us by Christ, but only through Paul's writings. When Christ was talking to his friends, Israel, we were his enemies. That means that what Christ tells us through the Apostle Paul is the best possible news in that when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans 5 verse 10 The Lord Jesus Christ was made under the law, Galatians 4 verse 4, and instructed those who listened to him in the Gospels to follow the teachings of those who sit in Moses' seat. Matthew 23 verses 1 to 3. When Christ taught Paul the revelation of the mystery, Colossians 1 verses 25 to 26, we learn that we are not under the law, Romans 6 verse 14, and should stand in our liberty, Galatians 5 verse 1, because the law is now weak and beggarly. Galatians 4 verse 9. Just as Jehovah God spoke to Israel through the prophets, Christ speaks to us through Paul. Romans 11 verse 13 For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office.
Romans 11 verse 13, KJV. Starting in Acts chapter 9, Christ actually met with Paul several times, Acts 26 verses 16 to 17, and he gave Paul our doctrine. 1 Timothy 1 verse 3. When the Lord Jesus was talking to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, he told them to search the scriptures because they spoke of him. John 5 verse 39. Christ was Israel's prophesied Messiah, and so when Jesus was doubted, he sent his doubters to the scriptures. None of Paul's 13 books were written when Christ was challenged by unbelieving Jews, and that time, Paul was still Saul, was also an unbeliever. After Christ dealt with Saul in Acts 9, Paul emerged with information that was so new and different that it could not be found by searching the scriptures. That is why Paul says that what he wrote included unsearchable riches of Christ, Ephesians 3 verse 8, which had been kept hidden. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 7. Admittedly, it is hard to look past the red letters, especially when we see such juicy verses as, and all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Matthew 21 verse 22, no doubt you haven't even one selfish bone in your entire body, but even so you must admit that is one prayer promise you would rather not look past. And what could be better than getting whatsoever you ask? We learn from Paul that now we actually get now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Ephesians 3 verse 20 KJV our prayer promise is better than the one Christ gave to Kingdom Israel in that we get God's best for us, and that is very good since we don't even know for what we should ask. Romans 8 verse 26 Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself mocketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans 8 verse 26 KJV Jesus was talking to you in the books that Paul wrote means that you have been disobedient to Christ when you failed to pay attention to Paul. Oops. What Christ said to Israel, under the law, about Israel's earthly kingdom, was spoken of by all the prophets and what Paul said, to the body of Christ, free from the law, about a heavenly home according to mutually exclusive. You can't have it both ways. You can't accept Christ's having been made a curse for you and still think you can be cursed for not tithing. That is such good news, especially when you learn from Paul's preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that 1. You are the church, not just a member of somebody's man-made organization. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake which is the church. Colossians 1 verse 24, KJV. 2. You are complete in Christ, without water baptism, without the membership's approval, without living it, without enduring to the end. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2 verses 8 to 10 KJV. 3. You are not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6 verse 14. 4. God is at peace with you, even when you mess up. Romans 5 verse 1. 5. God forgives you because of Calvary, not because you asked. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, Colossians 2 verse 14. 6. You are reconciled to God and God saves your soul when you trust Christ's payment for your sins, not because of your good works. Titus 3 verse 5. 7. God sees you as a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, crucified with Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20. 8. Rather than inheriting Israel's kingdom on the earth, your blessings are in heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 3. 
9. You give because you want to, and you give what and when you are able, not a certain amount, because you must. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7. 10. Just as God has provided our salvation by grace through faith in his words, God would have us to walk in newness of life by grace through faith in his words, not by sight, wonders or works. Colossians 2 verse 6. The logistics are simple. When we turn our backs on Paul, we turn toward either Christ's dealing with Israel in the Old Testament books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Hebrews 9 verses 15 to 17, or we turn toward the Hebrew epistles which are written to tribulation Israel to help them during their great tribulation. Hebrews 2 verse 5. We would be wrong to turn our backs on Paul since Christ would have Paul to be our pattern, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. We know that the Old Testament was given to Israel, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, but what we may have missed is that Israel also gets the New Testament. Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, Hebrews 8 verses 8 to 10. The term New Testament Christian is not in the Bible and is an oxymoron since the New Testament belongs to Israel and in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. Colossians 3 verse 11. We know that the Old Testament does not start at Genesis 1 verse 1, but rather 69 chapters later, and we know the New Testament does not exist before the cross. Hebrews 9 verses 15 to 18. And now we know we are in neither the old nor the new, we are, drum roll please, the church of what's happening now. So, how? Did we get in this mess whereby almost every church and every almost churchgoer has missed the plain and simple truth that Jesus wasn't talking to you? You may want to verify what you are about to read in books that deal with the history of the church for the past 20 or so centuries, but here is a summary of a digest of the Cliff Notes. After three centuries of Antinicene church fathers posturing positions, Doctrinal declension went from bad to worse after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Peter was said to be the pattern, our church was said to have begun with John and Peter, and our instructions were said to be all about what would Jesus do? As we follow in his steps. When the Emperor Constantine declared himself to be the Summus Pontifex, what followed was more than ten centuries of dark ages during which time people who professed Christ rather than Mary or the popes, people who denied transubstantiation, were fed to lions, or burned at the stake. During the Dark Ages, for a common person to read the Bible was a sin for which was no forgiveness, and so, the people were spoon-fed from the papist pulpit. The Bible was said to exist only in the Latin text and the common and largely illiterate people could learn the stories that were in the Bible from paintings and stained glass windows. Those who first made the Bible available in the language of the people were killed for their trouble, but when Martin Luther quoted Paul, of all people, the Protestant Reformation began. Sad to say, the Protestant acorn did not fall far from the shade of the tree that produced the Dark Ages. And so, the recovery of Pauline doctrine has been tedious and slow. Since no personage in the history of the world is as important as the Lord Jesus Christ, it is easy to see why Christ would be given more attention than Paul. What has been missed is that Christ delegated to Paul those doctrines which constitute our marching orders, and when Christians do not follow the Pauline pattern, they are being disobedient to the very Lord Jesus they claim to follow. If that is or is not a reasonable synopsis of how Paul's books became so neglected, the undeniable fact is, they were and still are. In defense of his support of same-sex unions, President Barack Obama, at a campaign event in Ohio said, if people find that controversial, then I would just refer them to the Sermon on the Mount, which I think is, in my mind, for my faith, more central than an obscure passage in Romans. When the 44th Commander-in-Chief purchased his Bible, all 66 books of the Bible were included, all equally accessible, none of them obscure. Romans became obscure, no doubt, because Romans was not being read as much as Matthew. Might that be partly because while in Chicago, 
President Obama attended a church oriented toward community organizing based on Israel's kingdom, thus rendering Romans obscure? Rather than imagining there's no heaven, no hell beneath us, above us only sky as John Lennon would have us to do, imagine if Paul's books had been central for the past 1500 or so years, rather than obscured by making Christ's message to kingdom Israel the center of attention. Most certainly, this would be a very different world, and hell would not be littered with water, baptized people who tried to follow in Jesus' steps. The first red-letter New Testament ever printed was published in 1899, and the first complete Bible with Christ's words in red came out two years later. Lars Klopsch came up with the idea, and this is what he said about printing Christ's words in red. The reader is enabled to trace unerringly the scarlet thread of prophecy from Genesis to Malachi. Like the star which led the Magi to Bethlehem, this light shining through the entire word leads straight to the person of the divine Messiah as the fulfillment of the promise of all the ages. And so, the red letters were ever and always intended to point to the Messiah and his fulfillment of prophesied promise, and that is exactly what they have accomplished. The problem with that is when he served as Israel's Messiah and as he fulfilled prophecy's promise. Jesus wasn't talking to you. None of these matters if the Bible is nothing more than a history of ancient peoples, interesting only for its corroboration of historical accounts. One might just as well use books by Flavius Josephus or Edward Gibbons. None of these matters if the Bible is nothing more than a source of pithy sayings used to garnish devotional talks. One might just as well use Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac or Charles Schultz's Theology of Peanuts. However, this matters greatly if the Bible is God's words of wisdom and instruction to be believed and acted upon. Colossians 1 verses 9 to 10 At that point, knowing when the Lord is speaking to us and when he is not matters because acting upon his instructions has eternal consequences. There are millions upon millions of people who own very nice gilt-edged genuine leather-bound Bibles that they never read much less study. There are millions upon millions of people who have no use for the Bible except at weddings and funerals, and even then, they don't much care about the contents beyond Psalm 23. There are millions and millions of people, and their number increases each year, who no longer see the Bible as relevant having relegated it to the scrap heap of the outdated and outmoded stories and myths of a bygone era. And while this information has no meaning to those millions, if you are one of the few who cares about what Jesus said and to whom he said it, learning that Jesus was talking to you in Paul's writings may be the most important truth you learned since the day you were saved. Jesus was asked, What good thing shall I do, that I may have eternal life? Matthew 19 verse 16, and Jesus did not say anything about his death on the cross, his burial for three days, or his resurrection. What Christ did say was, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19 verse 17. Our salvation is a gift given by grace, through faith, and not by works. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9. The gospel by which our souls are saved does not appear in the red letters and is not stated in any of the four gospels. We must go to Paul, as our Lord would have us to do. It is Paul and only Paul who will declare unto you the gospel, by which also ye are saved, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. It is Paul who teaches us that we have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2 verse 20. It is Paul who teaches us how to pray, Colossians 1 verses 9 to 10. It is Paul because the Lord Jesus Christ gave to Paul the doctrines that we need to act upon so that we do all that we do, not for Paul, but for Christ.